Grace to you and peace in our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, welcome. Let us prepare our hearts for worship as we come into God's house this day.
Let us worship God. Cry out with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. For the Lord is gracious God, whose mercy is everlasting. This is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I will forgive their evil deeds. I will remember their sin no more. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Holy Triune God, we confess that we have not lived for your glory. You show us what is good, but we choose the ways of evil. 
You show us what is right, but we fail to do your will. Forgive us, God of grace. Redeem us from our sin and restore us to your image so that our lives may honor you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hear the good news. There is nothing we can do to make God love us any less, and there is nothing we can do to make God love us any more. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Since God in Christ has forgiven us, let us also forgive one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Good morning and welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church. We're so glad you're here. If you are visiting with us, we hope you will come back often. If you think Westminster is a place where you might like to live out your discipleship, a member of the church will greet you just through these doors on your left after worship to answer any questions you may have about the ministry and work of our church. There's a friendship pad on the inside aisle. If you will sign your name and pass that down and back, we can greet one another by name following the service. We're glad you're here.
The Lord be with you. Eternal God, your spirit inspired those who wrote the Bible and enlightens us to hear your word fresh each day. Help us to rely always on your promises in scripture. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our passage this morning is from the book of Amos, chapter 7, verses 7 through 17. Hear the word of the Lord. Our ears are open. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of jo Judah. Earn your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is the temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel, and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword, and your land shall be parceled out by line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land, and Israel shall surely go into exile. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Turn to hymn 763 for Psalm 82. We will read the verses responsively and sing the refrain together. arises in the council of heaven and gives judgment in the midst of the gods. Save the weak and the orphan, defend the humble and needy. neither do they understand. They go about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Now I say to you, you are God, and all of your children are on the Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any leader.
this morning to have Diane and John Fowler with us, um, our dear friends and mission workers from Izmir, Turkey. Uh, those of us who had the chance to go on the Greece-Turkey trip a number of years ago were absolutely blessed when we showed up at Ephesus and I had been trying to communicate and lo and behold, they were there. And now they are here with us and we are so grateful for you and your work, uh, working in the teaching ER medicine and working with um, handicapped folks doing wheelchair volleyball and tennis, and uh, we are so grateful for your presence with us today. God's blessings on you both. Our text this morning comes from Colossians chapter 1. This is beginning of a couple of weeks where we'll be in the book of Colossians, reading from verse uh, 1 through 14. Hear the word of God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel, that has come to you, just as it's bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may leave lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to God, as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with the strength that comes from God's glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, with joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I gave Terry the information for the bulletin last Tuesday, I had very different expectation for the direction and form that my sermon was going to take. I just got back from the West Coast last Saturday after having been at General Assembly, and I was planning to talk a little bit about that. But our preaching staff at seminary taught us that you needed to preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And the events of this week cry out from the newspaper, from the television, and for every possible social medium. The news this week has shocked and stunned us. Alton Sterling, an African-American, killed in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, by police who had him pinned to the ground. Philando Castile, an African-American, killed in St. Paul, Minnesota, by police during a traffic stop for a broken taillight with his wife and child in the car. Five police officers, Brent Thompson, Lord Ahrens, Patrick Zampari, Michael Smith, Michael Kroll, were deliberately and maliciously murdered and seven others wounded while faithfully protecting citizens as they watched over a peaceful protest in Dallas. And each of these atrocities were broadcast live on social media. Instead of Colossians, we might well look to Ezekiel, the weeping prophet, who cries, go throughout the city and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over the detestable things that are being done in it. 
Or we might look to lamentations. My eyes are spent with weeping. My stomach churns. My bile is poured out on the ground because of the destruction of my people. Because infants and babies faint in streets in the city. I am grateful that we have scriptures that can speak for us when we have no words to say. We join in the chorus of ages, how long, O Lord, how long? There will surely be time for words of hope. There'll be time for concrete actions, but after last week, this is a time to lament what America has become right before our eyes. This week, issues of racism and gun violence are again in front of us in a way that cannot be ignored. It feels like we're back in 1968 rather than in the 21st century. Over this past Memorial Day, a four-night, eight-hour remake of Roots, the saga of an American family premiered. Did any of you see it? Anybody watch it? How many of you saw it when it came on in 1977? Based on Alex Haley's 1976 novel, the original broadcast aired on eight consecutive nights from January 23rd through January 30th and was watched by an estimated half of the U.S. population, the largest viewership ever attracted by any type of television series in our history. I vividly recall watching it. The, the whole Northeast was snowed in. I was out of school for 10 days. They shut every airport down from Boston to Philadelphia to D.C. and west. It was, it was unbelievable. And all people did was watch and talk about it. I remember calling my high school girlfriend one of the nights that it was on and being uh, not a little ticked off that she wouldn't talk on the phone until after that night's episode was over. As if I wasn't more important. The epic story covered more than 200 years and six generations of Haley's family, and the book and TV show provided a catalyst for us to think and talk about race with empathy and compassion. Initially, that story centers around uh, Kunta Kinte, Haley's fifth great grandfather, as opening chapter describes the tribal custom concerning birth and naming a child on the eighth day. The, the description is significant. Oboro, the father, then walked out before the assembly of people in the village, moving to his wife's side. He lifted up the infant, and all watched, and he whispered three times into the son's ear the name that he had chosen for him. It was the first time that that name had ever been spoken as the child's name, for Omoro's people felt that each human being should be the first to know who he or she was. To, to underscore the importance of this child's identity, the first chapter of Roots closes with the father taking his infant son out into the night and lifting him up to face heavens and proclaiming, Behold, the only thing greater than yourself. The, the scene is a great celebration of identity, a, a ritual to remember. Knowing who we are is essential. And in Colossians, the author addresses the question of identity. The writer rehearses the good news of the gospel as the touchstone for our always remembering who we are and whose we are. As we celebrate two baptisms this morning, it's fitting that we reflect together on what it means that our identity is grounded in God through the water of the baptismal font. Little Owen at the early service and baby Baylor will not know or understand the weighty words or solemn promises taken on their behalf unless their parents and the church family take seriously the responsibility to teach them and perhaps even more importantly, model the Christian life to them. The middle of last month marked the date 56 years ago when I was baptized. 
There were three of us baptized that morning. Sherry Strubeck, who last I knew was still teaching the fifth grade Sunday school at my home church. And David Morgan Joint, graduated high school with me and then was at Princeton Seminary with me and now pastors a church in Arizona. I don't know, a lot of us have been baptized out of tradition with not a great deal of sense of connecting it to our daily discipleship. I never really thought about my baptism until, well, when I was in seminary. The liturgy is different now than what was used then, but if we're serious about the vows, we'll quake in our shoes. Listen for it when it comes. The question is asked, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and all its power in the world? Do you? Friends, that's a, that's a tall mountain. Do any of us really do that? I look in a mirror and I am judged by how far I fall from living into those vows. We have witnessed evil and its power in the world this week. And much of the evil has been race-based. We are afraid, we're angry, or worse, we're indifferent. We go about our vacations and our cookouts and our business without once pondering what we've done to contribute or to perpetuate racial prejudice in our families, in our church, in our neighborhoods, in our country. Some of you know a wonderful young woman named Susan Kelly. She moved here about a year ago, sometimes sings in our choir, went with the choir on the trip to Ireland with her husband. Susan was the director of music ministries at my dear friend Bill Carter's church up near Scranton, Pennsylvania. All last summer he was calling me, Susan's coming, Susan's coming, Susan's coming. Susan is this wisp of a woman with bright red hair and about as pale a white skin as I've ever seen. She was called to join the faculty of TSU to rebuild their traditional choir program. She wrote, I have a feeling of immense guilt all year about not being more vocal about the events that are happening in our country as a white woman who spent most of her life in Northeast PA. It was easy to believe that racism was a thing of the past. Moving to the South and teaching at a historic black college or university quickly cured me of my ignorance. Even when there is no blatant racism, there is so often a clear divide. It's at Walmart where my sweet soprano, who works as a cashier, tells me about how a white customer slid money across the counter so she didn't have to touch her hand. I play at a church where I'm often the only person who looks like me and sing in a church where the reverse would be true. And I now own a house in a neighborhood that is unknown to most of my white friends, but not so mysterious to most of my students. We still have so far to go. We still have so far to go. Both our texts from Psalm 82 and Amos speak of God's judgment. The prophet Amos comes to the big city from the farm and he's packed his plumb line from the carpenter's box as a visual aid. You're off kilter, he tells the king and the king's priest. In our day, former Duke chaplain Will Willimon observes, we tend to think of judgment and an exclusively negative way. A judging God is what we got over when we discovered a loving, gracious God. You've no doubt heard the Old Testament that the Old Testament is a collection of laws and judgment. The New Testament is a collection of love and grace. This is not only a grossly unfair characterization of Hebrew scriptures, but also a mischaracterization of biblical views on judgment. In the Bible, the judgments of God are part of the graciousness of God. You know, we're a reformed church, always reforming. 
that reformation comes after judgment. A biblical judge is someone who not only makes judgments about the rectitude of behavior, but also actively seeks to work justice, to set things right. We affirm the Apostles' Creed that one day the Lord shall come to judge the living and the dead. In the end, as in the beginning, we do not come to Jesus. Jesus comes to us. The God who comes to us is a seeking shepherd, a searching woman. Come to us this time as loving judge to set things right between God and God's people. In modern life, I think most of us want to be left alone, left to our own devices to live our lives as we please, immune from judgments upon our lives that are not exclusively self-derived. But the God of Israel and the church will not leave us alone. God comes to us sometimes through the words of a prophet like Amos, loving us enough to tell us the truth about ourselves. To look in a mirror and say, the national identity is out of kilter. Are not the horrific events in Dallas and St. Paul and Baton Rouge enough to call for repentance over racism and our idolatry and fetishism of guns and carrying guns? As one observer has noted, having a nation of men carrying concealed lethal weapons pretty much guarantees that there will be lethal results, an outcome only made worse by our toxic racial history. Joe Clifford, pastor at First Presbyterian Dallas, Texas, a young man called to ministry from this church as a young adult. He's become a friend of Donovan's and mine. First Pres is the church where the mayor of Dallas attends. He wrote, we must also be increasingly mindful of rhetoric that erodes the public's trust in public institutions. Call for and work for justice within those institutions, yes, but polarizing our citizens such that it creates hostility toward elected officials and law enforcement this is exceedingly dangerous. We must hold our public officials and police accountable, but we can do so without creating hostility toward them, without censoring ourselves. We must ask how our rhetoric and actions might be perceived by lone wolves, by mentally unstable. It's an incredibly challenging walk, but those who are committed justice seekers need to walk it. One of the things we did in Portland at the General Assembly was talk a little bit about the identity of the church. And it's changing. It's changing in remarkable ways. But not the least way it's changing is in the visible leadership of our denomination. For the first time, we had co-moderators elected, not a moderator and a vice moderator. And there are two women and one is an incredibly talented woman of color. Our new stated clerk, a long time gifted pastor in the church, is also an African American man. They provide a tremendous leadership out there and I'm excited for this new dimension in our common life together. One of the other expressions was we voted to add to our creeds and confessions, our book of the Constitution that are subordinate standards, the Belhar Confession out of South Africa. It's the first confession that is not from Europe or North America. It was written in the middle of the apartheid struggle by the Dutch Reformed Church. And it says in part, we believe that God has entrusted the church with a message of reconciliation in and through Jesus Christ that the church is called to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That the church is called blessed because it is a peacemaker. And that the church is witnessed both by word and by deed to the new heaven and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. 
When Paul greets the young church in Colossae, he looks at a particular feature in their new life, which he draws attention. He lifts up that it's your love in the Spirit. Paul hears from his colleague Epaphras, not that certain people have wonderful spiritual experience, not that others uh, have studied systematics and know it down pat, but that there has come into existence in Colossae a community of people who love one another across traditional boundaries. Friends, in the crisis of our time, can that same can that same message be said about us? Amen. We would like to invite the children who are here to come sit on the floor here so they can be a part of the baptism while we sing the hymn. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. 
And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus Christ and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called his own. God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us remember with joy our own baptism as we celebrate this sacrament. On behalf of the session, I present Baylor Gray Elkins Moran, child of Anna and Jackson Moran, to receive the sacrament of baptism. Anna and Jackson, Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to your child, do you? And to the congregation, do you as members of the Church of Jesus Christ promise to guide and nurture Baylor by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging him to know and follow Christ and be faithful members of his church, do you? And to you all, do you promise to be Baylor's friend and to help him learn about Jesus? If so, please say yes, nice and loud. Yes. Thank you. Through baptism, we enter the covenant God has established. Within this covenant, God gives us new life, guards us from evil, and nurtures us in love. In embracing that covenant, we choose whom we will serve by turning from evil and turning to Jesus Christ. As God embraces you within the covenant, I ask you to reject sin, to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, and to confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? Do you? Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? Do you? Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Will you? With the whole church, let us confess our faith. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Eternal and gracious God, we give you thanks in countless ways. You have revealed yourself in ages past and have blessed us with signs of your grace. We praise you that through the waters of the sea you led your people Israel out of bondage into freedom in the land of promise. We praise you for sending Jesus, your son, who for us was baptized in the waters of the Jordan and was anointed as Christ by your Holy Spirit. Through the baptism of his death and resurrection, you set us free from the bondage of sin and death and give us cleansing and rebirth. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this water, that this font may be your womb of new birth. May all who pass through these waters be delivered from death to life, from bondage to freedom, from sin to righteousness. Bind them to the household of faith, guard them from evil. Strengthen them to serve you with joy until the day you make all things new. To you be all praise, honor, and glory through Jesus Christ our Savior, 
who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. What is the Christian name of this child? Come on, Dad, you can come closer, too. Baylor Gray Elkins Moran. Baylor Gray Elkins Moran. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and forever. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as God's own forever. Amen. You are a precious child. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. O Eternal One, it would be easier to pray if we were clear and of a single mind and a pure heart. If we could be done hiding from ourselves and from you even in our prayers. But we are who we are, mixture of motives and excuses, blur of memories, quiver of hopes, not of fear, tangle of confusion, and restless with love for love. We wander somewhere between gratitude and grievance, wonder and routine, high resolve and undone dreams. Come find us, Lord. Be with us ex exactly as we are. Help us find ourselves, Lord. Help us accept who we are so we can begin to be more fully yours. Call us out of our tomb of timidity into the chance glory of our possibilities and power of your presence. We pray that you would cultivate such love in us that we may reach out in compassion to all those who are hurting this day. Where there is illness, give, give kindness to those who bring healing. Where there is anguish of soul, give tender strength to those who console. For those who grieve in Dallas, Baton Rouge, and St. Paul, wrap them in your tender, abiding love. 
where there is prejudice, give endurance to those who see beauty in differences. Where there is violence and hate, give strength to those who seek peace and justice. Great God, especially this day, we lift up to you those going to Heifer this week. Bless their journey, both physically and spiritually, so they may know you and each other a bit better. We also give thanks for Diane and John Fowler's work in Turkey and pray your continued blessing on them there. By your Holy Spirit, O God, make us willing answers of the prayers we make. All of our prayers are in the name of the Christ. Amen. Trusting God, let us share what we have and who we are. Let us receive our offering.
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Eternal God, creator of the world, and giver of all good, we thank you for the earth, our home, and for the gift of life. We praise you for your love in Jesus Christ. who came to heal this broken world, who died rejected on the cross, and rose triumphant from the dead. Because he lives, we live to praise you, our God, forever. Gracious God, who called us from death to life, we give ourselves to you, and with the church through all ages, we thank you for your saving love in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Go into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Render no one evil for evil. Support the weak. Strengthen the afflicted. Comfort and honor all persons. Love the Lord and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.